Um, we're really honored to have you here. There's a it's a longer bio, um, but I, we're we're really looking forward to hear what you have to say. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alladhi akmal lana dinana wa atamma alayna ni'matahu bil-deen wa faddal lana ala kathiran min man khalqa tuftila wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaneen alladhi arsalahu allahu bil-huda wa deen al-haq liyudhirahu ala al-deen kullihi walau kariha al-mushikun رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم رب زدني زدنا علما وعلما اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته so today my topic is on uh, i think it was advertises homosexuality from an islamic perspective um, but before we get into the issue of homosexuality and the Islamic perspective and stance, I think uh, I want to cover sort of this psychosexual development um, from an Islamic perspective. And in order to be able to, um, to understand kind of subcategories of sexual preference and orientations, uh, we need to kind of understand the normative understanding of sexuality. Uh, in the Islamic tradition before we get into that. Um, so there are some precepts that I'm going to outline that are kind of foundational principles um, of the Islamic uh, uh, creed and tradition that needs to be understood in, in order to be able to understand kind of divergent or broader issues that kind of spring out of that. Um, meaning kind of our theoretical understanding and, and precepts uh, of, of, of theology and creed and how we understand human behavior and functioning and sexuality. Sort of the principles of these things before we can explore specific questions of, uh, uh, of things like homosexuality and other things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا. That that on that day he completed the religion, uh, your religion, uh, to the Muslims, and he completed his favors upon you, meaning us, the Muslims, and he was satisfied with Islam being the uh, religion for us. So, what we have to kind of understand, first of all, is that the Islamic tradition emphasizes at its core uh, a God-based construct in understanding morality and ethics and human functioning. Okay, this is very important to understand. Um, and so, God is at the center of all morality, of understanding where morality comes from. So, for example, in the Qur'an, it says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُوا الرَّسُولُ رُسُولَ وَأُولُوا الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَعَتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرَدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا and those in authority amongst you. And if you dispute, you have a concern, you're not really sure in, uh, in specific with your leader or those in authority over you or those around you, then return to فَرَدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ So go back to what does the Allah, God, and the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam wasallam, say. If you believe if you indeed, and the condition is here that you believe in the last day, and, you, and uh, uh, if you believe in God in the last day, and that is the best manner, that is the best approach. So we understand from this that this is a God-based system in which our morality stems out of an understanding that the world 
is beyond the temporal world and, and into the afterlife. So we kind of, this is where we derive our morality. The reason why I'm emphasizing this and starting with this is because this is very different than the conception of morality um, that we might be used to in the Western world uh, or in the modern world today. Every era, and, and, and mashallah, most of you, uh, all of you guys here are at a prestigious university, so you can sort of appreciate, uh, I, I'm going to kind of, the Prophet ﷺ said, um, that I was commanded to speak to people in accordance with their levels of intellect. So you guys are very like, I'm making the assumption that very bright people being admitted in such a college. So you kind of sh should understand, therefore, that we are in the moral, a the, the era of, of what? What is this? Is it Renaissance? Is it Romanticism? Is it the Dark Age? Where do we end? Can anybody answer this question for us? All of you bright Northwestern uh, university students. Is it modernism? Are we in the modern era? Are we in the technological kind of era? Postmodern? Postmodern, yeah. Relative. Yeah, we're in the postmodern era. You don't count because you came with me. So like, <laughs> <laughs> he's exposed to my mind all the time. So, like, <laughs> so we're in the postmodern era. What's characteristic of the postmodern era is essentially a uh, is that morality is relative. It's subjective to the individual. And so, since it's subjective then the state of postmodern era of Western societies should have limited sort of control in governing the individual freedoms and moralities and choices of the indiv of, of personal choice uh, and autonomy. And we do not believe in such a system, right, of uh, this sort of subjective morality. And it passes through phase, phases, you know, every era has characteristics with it. The Islamic tradition is a stable, God-based system, so that the morality remains. The application may change based upon time, which means that we have to be, you know, aware of our times in order to, be, uh, to apply it. Um, but, but, the, but the morality itself doesn't change. So we have to understand this precept that we do believe in a big T that there is a universal morality that we subscribe to and that there is a moral ethic that God himself has revealed to humankind and wants humankind to follow this tradition. So you kind of have to understand this, this basic foundation uh, before we get further. Other things we can contrast it with is if we take morality from, say, uh, a biological standpoint. Does biology determine morality? If something is natural or in, in nature, Again, uh, for us, um, Islam is at the, uh, the, the God is at the top of the hierarchy in terms of building morality. Okay? Survival of the fittest. Is it, the evolu is it evolution that determines morality? People have used these systems, such as uh, Hitler, for example, in Nazi Germany, to justify the killings of, of minorities and Jews in particular, uh, believing the Aryan race to be the superior race the sort of like genetically um, advanced superior race and therefore we need to replicate those genes in the offspring uh, uh, to influence natural selection. So we, again, I'm returning just to reinforce this point that we need to understand that God is at the top of the uh, list uh, of morality. Now having said that, do we then not, so what, what place does um, biology have in the Islamic tradition? Where does biology fit into the scheme of things from now that we've understood that God is at the top of it? Now how does this tradition understand uh, human biology? Well, we believe that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth <coughs> and the human being. And so he created its inclinations and tendencies and biological dispositions and predispositions and therefore knows that human, human being best. And our attempt at science at uncovering the human uh, dispositions and behavior 
is an attempt of uncovering the patterns that have been fashioned by God already on the world, in the world. He's already set in a system, we're just discovering it. Okay? Metamorphosis and, uh, you know, photos, photosynthesis and all of these things, like, they, they're not, the, 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 the Quran did not come to, as a scientific book, but it came with uh, ethics and morals and, the, and, and, and uh, creed, but it also has hints of looking to the earth, looking to, <clears throat> you know, look at, look at the things around you to be able to discover them. So scientific inquisition and discovery about the patterns that Allah has fashioned. But we do like, uh, put at the top of the hierarchy, once again, God, meaning that we don't start in, in empiricism, for example, empirical science, we start with what? We start with a hypothesis, no assumptions to begin with, at least in clean science, what we're supposed to start with, right? It doesn't always happen that way, we know that in science. You know, the reason, you know, why you come up with certain hypotheses can uh, certainly influence the direction of your study, but in a Puritan way, you start with uh, no assumptions whatsoever. You, try, you come up with some ideas, and then you go test that out through your data. In the Islamic tradition, we don't have that concept. We do believe that God takes precedence over all things. And that science may complement or go against it, but if it does go against the God-based system, then we believe that it's either an, uh, inevitable that over time we'll discover it to be consistent with, the Islam, with what God has to say, or that we are, our minds have not been able to wrap, wrap our minds around it. There must be some way of reconciling this this system, which, you know, Muslim scientists have never had this problem of separation between church, church and state or mosque and state. We've always been able to sort of reconcile and, and, and be scientists, yet still stay true to the foundational principles of the creed and not really had too many problems with, with, that, with that problem, with that issue. Now come to, you know, in a long-winded way, I kind of laid out the philosophical sort of orientation. I generally wouldn't do this uh, in such an elaborate way um, with sort of a community seminar, but again, uh, I'm taking you guys as very like philosophically advanced and theoretically advanced as Northwestern students, and so you might appreciate that from an academic perspective. Now let's turn to our discussion at hand. Keep this in the back of your mind, okay, while we're traversing through this seminar or, or talk. Now let's move on to the issue of sexuality. So when the person is born, um, We believe that every person is born on the fitra, is born on the natural disposition that God has made, uh, made this individual. Now, that natural disposition is essentially a recognition of God of uh, of of his cre of him being a creator in monotheism, as well as um, a need to want to a dr a, a predisposed uh, drive to want to connect with God, which even in evolutionary psychology they believe that human beings are born with a God concept. Now, and it's the environment that can cause the person to believe in atheism, for example, or in other concepts or ideologies that negate God or the existence of Him and basic sets of universal morality, morals. But then, he also cre but then we also have an another element of us, which is the nafs. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا that by the soul and the way that he fashioned it, that God has fashioned the nafs, which is the automatic inclinations of the human being, not the, not the natural disposition, right? The natural disposition, we, we believe the person is born good, with a pure uh, desire to do good. Nobody's born as an evil criminal, okay? Um, but he has inclinations that, that he has to, uh, uh, that, 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 um, that God has fashioned him with some potential predispositions. Uh, and it has a capacity to do wrong, it also has a capacity to do good, and the most successful one is the one who purifies it. The person who has rebelled and goes and, uh, um, uh, um, and he gives preference to the temporal life 
then the in the afterlife the hellfire is his abode. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافْ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَى النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى But the person who fears, has fear of Allah, uh, has fear of God, and he goes against those dispositions which uh, he has put there, and every person is created different with different inclinations and tr struggles, then that person, he will be in, uh, in, in Jannah, in heaven, uh, dwelling forever. So we have to understand that human beings have a pure nature, but they also have dispositions that they must uh, mold, okay? Now, specifically into sexuality. Once a person is born, they, uh, they have, through their life cycle, certain dispositions that might come about. For example, at around, um, you know, in, in uh, developmental psychology, um, in early childhood, around like five or, five or six, a person develops a selfishness, meaning like they don't have the theory of mind, they have the ability to appreciate that I'm hurting the feelings of somebody else. So they say, so they want everything for themselves and see the world from other people, uh, for their own perspective. If I hit you or if I play with you rough in a certain way, it doesn't bother me, but it bo but so why are you complaining? I don't get it, like, I'm not bothered by it. So they don't have the ability to appreciate somebody else's mind, you understand? Or to give up selflessness. If a person is left alone with this disposition, they'll never recover it. They'll, they'll essentially remain selfish. They won't be trained. That's what tarbiya is, uh, training in the Islamic tradition, child rearing. So we train that child to be conscious of other people, to be empathic, to be selfless, and over time they acquire those traits. Now let's turn to sexuality. We are sexual beings. Sexuality is a very important part of human functioning and human beings. We are endowed with sexual anatomy and organs. And in, so in, in the Islamic tradition, we prepare individuals to become full-fledged sexual beings when they become pubescent, when they reach purity or reach their menarche, um, when the woman has her period and the man has um, his, his first nocturnal emission. We prepare individuals for this stage. How? One premise that one you, uh, person must understand is that, again, God created the inher inherent biologies of the people, of human beings, so they're going to have the natural inclination to be sexual beings, to have attraction and love and to want to fulfill their sexual desires at some point, particularly when they reach puberty. Very natural inclination. Um, now, we prepare ourselves for that. Well, we recognize that there's a sexuality and we don't think that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, we celebrate sexuality in the Islamic tradition. But what we do is we want to ensure that we don't allow it to become animalistic, out of control. Okay? So we know that there's going to be this explosive sexual, uh, uh, this is, uh, explosive sexual exploration that's going to take place once a person is a full-fledged sexual being. And then what we want to do is we want to prepare that individual to be able to, um, uh, to, to harness or control some of that and to direct that sexuality, okay? So what we do then is another premise is we divide the world, divide our worlds into by genders. And again, this is another precept that you must understand that is inherent principle within the Islamic tradition um, that if you don't really understand, you might not get other things when we get to talking about them. You sort of have to understand the philosophical underpinnings of the, uh, of the Islamic creed and, and, and philosophy and life, of life. So the human being, uh, uh, it, the, the child is separated by gender up, uh, in, as early as age seven or eight when they have some understanding of male and female, you know, the cooties stage when people start talking about the cooties. We start to understand that there are certain um, etiquettes and ethics to observe around how to interact with the opposite gender. And that one should not excessively interact with the opposite gender. So we do believe 
we do believe in the differential socialization of the genders. We socialize the genders in different ways. Okay, So we do not start with the premise that genders are born equal. Now, inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum, meaning that so we, this doesn't mean spirituality-wise, meaning that human males and females are spiritually equal, meaning that they have the potential, equal potential, to uh, achieve the love of Allah and connect with Him and to excel in the afterlife. Um, but we do believe that they are different. Now, the question of whether it's soci sociology or biology, are they socialized to be uh, males and females, because we socialize our females to like pink, that's why they like pink, well, in our, well, today in modernity, I mean, I think pe males even like pink now, right? I mean, that's a trend. So uh, maybe I'm speaking a little bit, you know, uh, uh, in the ancients for, for, for our time, for your time. It, in any case, Males and females are separated, uh, 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 may be socialized differently. Okay, the child is, a boy is taught to like, you know, army men and fighting and wrestling, and the woman is taught to play with tea, okay? So you might argue, well, this is socialization, it's not biology. We've socialized our, 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 our um, males and females to interact this way. Some might argue it's biological. They're inherently propelled to be this way. Now, it doesn't matter in the Islamic tradition. It doesn't matter whether they were so. It's it's our socialization, our biology. The bottom line is that we believe in the differential socialization of uh, of uh, of, uh, of genders. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. It, they can coexist or be mutually exclusive. It doesn't matter. We do teach to socialize males and females differently, and then we divide. The, um, uh, the, the males and females into their separate spaces. Now, you know, from an evolutionary psychological standpoint, we do believe that, that we found consistent and enough evidence to show that not only are males and females biologically different, but they are psychologically different creatures, okay? But putting aside that, we want to understand, regardless of where you stand on that, we do socialize differently, okay? So that means that women are socialized to... Uh, be in more private spaces and men in more public spaces. You have to understand that this is not um, hard and fast rules. They're not written in stone. Meaning that uh, that these are general concepts. Meaning that that it, it doesn't mean that a woman cannot come into the public sphere or that men cannot be in the private sphere. But you have to understand kind of general concepts, and then the application of that will will be contingent upon time, family, individual, all of that. Okay. But you have to understand that we do believe in the different socialization of the uh, male and female, and then we separate them. We separate them from each other. We observe certain ethics and rules around them. Um, we don't allow close contact between cousins, even though they might be uh, uh, cousins of diff uh, separate genders, of, uh, uh, of uh, distant relatives, for example, who are not direct relatives, uh, such as a, a paternal, maternal uncle who are connected by blood. Um, we distance our, so we separate our worlds and, and in fact our spaces by gender. Why? At the end of all of this, it's all sexuality, right? It, a child at seven or eight or ten years old has no conception of, uh, uh, maybe now due to Disney, but like aside, well, Disney's perversions now, unfortunately. Um, but before Disney and all of that, like in a, in a Puritan state, a child, children don't really have the conception of wanting to have sex with the opposite gender, maybe at, at age uh, 10 years old. But they will. And so we prepare them to be separated by gender, to moderate and to, and to have a certain kind of um, uh, uh, separation, division, and ethics and etiquettes between the genders. So now when they become in full-fledged sexual beings, Again, we have to understand, and we're going through this life cycle, that the, hum that the human being God created with his natural dispositions. So he has then advised, so we, it, Islam does not have a negative view of sexuality. We must understand this as well. Sexuality is not a bad thing in Islam. It's a counter to Catholicism, for example, 
the like sexual guilt and shame, for example, Catholic guilt, uh, it's celibacy. There's no such a thing in Islamic tradition. In fact, uh, who don't, whosoever doesn't uh, get married, they're going uh, against the, uh, you know, without any valid excuse, is going against the sunnah, the practice and tradition of the prophets uh, uh, of Islam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he, so we prepare individuals to get married, and then to allow an, uh, that as their safe space and outlet for their sexuality and for their biological uh, inclinations. So we give space to it. We celebrate it, and we allow it, uh, and, and, and we reward it, in fact, uh, uh, for, for having uh, our sexuality. That's very important to understand. Now, this is counter to some uh, popular Muslim cultures or, or uh, contemporary Muslim cultures. Uh, you know, some of it is influence of uh, the Victorian era and British culture and colonialism and European influences in the Muslim world. Um, there is sometimes an excessive sort of sexual repression among Muslims, meaning that it's taboo to discuss sexuality or to matters that relate to sexuality or for men to, for men in particular to be sexual creatures or women to want, want to be sexual beings, even with their spouses, for example, that they should, for example, not be approaching their husbands, that the man should be the one that should initiate and, uh, and he shouldn't be excessive in his imagination or fantasies, for example, because this is uh, against modesty or ethics. This is absolutely incorrect, okay? The Prophet, uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Qum biba He said, three things have been made beloved to me. He said, An-Nisa, women. He said, An-Nisa, at-Tib, uh, uh, good, uh, good smell, okay? Uh, and Qurrata Aynin fi salah and he said, uh, and, and, and uh, the coolness and, and the sort of uh, calmness that I find when I go into prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ was reported, again, this might not be popular with sort of modern uh, kind of, uh, so, sort of like some social cultures, but the Prophet ﷺ, he had multiple wives, which, uh, which, is ex which was acceptable during that time, is also uh, acceptable according to the Islamic tradition, Again, put aside the application for the moment. I don't necessarily advocate um, uh, for the sort of mass application of it in all settings at the moment. We just have to put that aside for a moment. Just kind of understand the philosophy of sexuality. The Prophet was, uh, was a person was narrating uh, a tradition uh, from the Prophet ﷺ. He's giving instruction, a sahabi, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ after his time to people in his gathering. And he says the Prophet ﷺ went... And, ha uh, and, and, and was intimate with all of his wives on separate occasions, of course, in the same day. Somebody said, how is that possible? Right? So is, it, is that even humanly possible? And he said, <laughs> rajula. He said the Prophet ﷺ was given the power of 50 men. Not physical strength, we're talking about sexual strength. So... Men, so we don't have this repression of the fact that like men are not allowed to be sexual beings and that it's bad and, uh, and, and that there is sort of some uh, stigma or taboo about sexuality. The, the, and and oh, Abdullah ibn Umar, for example, radiallahu anhu, he was the ashaddu ittiba'an li rasul sallallahu alayhi wa He was the person that was most following of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he would, he would at times break his fast with having uh, uh, intercourse with his wife, okay? So the, we have to get this idea out of our minds that hyper like the sexuality itself is bad. So hypersexuality in, in, uh, in its um, um, unrestrained, unbound, uh, no bound sort of like uh, areas is bad. Um, it being part of popular culture and marketing and objectification is bad in the Islamic tradition. But we do not go to the other extreme to say that there is a sexual repression. Now there's a concept of haya, <coughs> modesty, and not uh, talking about a person who, for example, goes and talks about his sexual relations with his wife in public. He, um, he is as if he is like an animal uh, that that has uh, he's like an animal that has se uh, sex with his wife and then goes and reports about it. You're not supposed to talk about your private sexual affairs, but the teaching of it and understanding of it is important. So, uh, uh, a woman would come to the Prophet ﷺ and say that, that 
Allah and uh, Allah, uh, Allah does not feel shy to speak the truth. O Messenger of Allah, does a woman, after, uh, if she has a nocturnal emission, uh, if she has like climax in her sleep, uh, does she then have to take a bath and, and clean herself up? And he and he said, if she sees uh, or senses uh, moistness, then yes, she does have to. So there's no shyness about the fact that in its place, it's got to be talked about. In our homes, it has to be taught to children and, and the expectation of it and normalize that it's not a bad thing, okay? It has to be in its place, okay? When it's in its place, it's celebrated, it's okay. Um, you know, the, uh, the, in, for example, in Judaism, um, there's this concept of, and it might be different based upon conservative or orthodox or whatnot, but from my exposure, it has been that a person is supposed to um, have a sheet and, 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 uh, and, and put a hole through the sheet and then have intercourse with their spouse in that way so that they don't even see the nakedness of their spouse. There was this discussion among, uh, amongst uh, Muslim scholars later about is it um, better to not see your spouse naked or is it better to see them naked? Okay, And one of the opinions that was mentioned by Abdullah ibn Umar, for example, was that he, uh, he said that it's actually good for a man to see his wife in the nude because then it will increase his sex drive and desire to be intimate with her. Okay, The Prophet again, uh, uh, then emphasized that when a man goes to his wife, he should go, uh, uh, go nicely, be calm, um, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of like freshen himself up. And so there's all of these injunctions. So we're not shy to talk about sexuality, and nor are we shy to celebrate sexuality. Okay, you might be stunned by some of what I'm saying, but, but that's okay, because we're not shy about sexuality in the Islamic tradition. But what we are shy about is... It's hypersexuality that it that Islam came to kind of confine and restrict some of this. And so, what is happening? And what is the recommendation? We know God knows that He created human beings as sexual beings, and He gives them appropriate outlets, and He encourages that people get married young. As soon as they become sexual beings, it's encouraged to get married. The practical application of this maybe might be, of course, difficult. The problem with that is not necessarily the idea itself, but the our social norms. What's happening is that our sexuality, our sexual maturation is in fact becoming younger and younger. Are right? becoming sexual creatures younger and younger? But our social requirements to allow that sexuality is going up and up. Right? You can't get married until you're 27 years old. Again, we believe in no sex before marriage, okay? So you can't get married until you're 27, 28, 30 years old, whatnot. Um, financially, you can't take care of a man. I'm not saying you have to go out and do it uh, and get married at the moment, but I'm saying just philosophically understand the challenge that we have. Um, so now what's happening then is that we are having more and more of the sexual urges at younger ages, which means biologically we should actually be getting married younger. If we just think about it like if that's the only outlet that we have, right? So we have to do one of two things. Either we have to get married in the according to our Islamic tradition, or what we have, um, or what we have to do, from practicality, is re is is to get rid of the rules of uh, having to get married, because it's gonna happen. We're sexual creatures. If we uh, if we don't have an outlet, it's gonna happen. I mean, just look at uh, the sort of the priests and what's happening there. If we don't, it's gonna happen. It's gonna come out one way or another. Okay. So we don't have any shyness about the fact that it's going to happen. What we say is put it in its place. Understand that it's there and put it in its place. So let's put it in its proper perspective and put the sort of uh, boundaries and restrictions around it and, part of, uh, and, and, then, and then allow it to, um, to manifest itself. And when it does, it's a beautiful thing. Okay. So, uh, so it, of course, in our modern society, what they what have they done? The reality is that they've allowed for uh, allowed for uh, sexuality to not be governed by religion, and to say that it's okay for you to have pre uh, premarital sex, right before set, before marriage. Um, and so, and if you don't, what ends up happening? We have pornography addictions, right? And we have all sorts of hypersexuality as a result of repression. The sexuality is coming out in many ways.
Okay? So, sexual exploration is directed and guided in the Islamic tradition. It's understood and it's nurtured, and once you become a sexual being, we direct it and we guide it and we give it its parameters. That's what we must understand. Okay? So that's kind of our understanding of, of sexuality and the sort of, this is a brief run through of the psychosexual uh, development of the human being. Now I'll touch upon the issue of homosexuality and then what I'll do is turn it more into uh, discussion and Q&A because I think that I can mention sort of general theoretical principles but in application how does it pertain to specific scenarios I think you guys might have questions about that and specific set settings and situations we might have to negotiate and discuss some of that. So, so far we've understood a few things. That it's a God-based system, that we socialize the genders and we're sexual beings. Islam doesn't repress sexuality. It allows it and gives it its space and celebrates it. In fact, uh, in the uh, early era, in the, 10th, uh, uh, in the 12th century, there was a book that was published called The Foundations of Pleasure and written in Arabic that was translated. Um, by a, a doctor by the name of Makhzumi, and he goes into all sorts of, it's essentially a sex therapy book, okay, and it's for public dissemination. Now, one might say, wow, 12th century, like, I thought, hi, we're in hypersexual times, that, how are they talking so openly about sexuality back then? Well, you have to understand that we didn't believe in this Victorian sexual repression idea that dissemination of this knowledge and understanding and discussion was not inappropriate. It was public knowledge and it was recommended in, in important places as to where, how, how to, even to the extent of techniques and uh, prophetic traditions about it and recommendations, and scholars wrote about it. So there wasn't this sort of like, uh, you know, giggly shyness that you find around sexuality as we might find today. Therefore, the sexual repression and sort of sexual um, issues were not as prevalent and addictions were not as prevalent as they are today. Now, let's touch upon the issue of homosexuality. Now, if we believe that this to be a God-based system, God regulates our sexuality, okay? So, and if we believe that we have a nafs that might be predisposed biologically, potentially, to multiple other things, that it doesn't necessarily justify the action or morality. So you have to understand that morality and biology do not always, uh, uh, so, so our, our ethics are not determined by biology, okay? So our ethic, so if a person if is, is proven to have uh, some kind of biological predisposition, it doesn't mean that it's moral. Okay? And it doesn't mean that it's inconsistent or how, somehow a threat to the moral question. The moral question is independent of the biological question. Okay? The morality is a God-based system. Biology is not the yardstick in which we dis determine our morality. So, and we are very consistent in that procedure. The morality is consistent in that regard. My question would be then, if we take biology to be the yardstick, then why are we holding inconsistent and double standards? Okay? So if we take biology, a person might say that they're biologically predisposed to homosexuality, and I believe that there's a lot of psychological evidence for this and biological evidence. They're predisposed towards homosexuality. My answer to that is, so what? Does it mean that that is uh, necessarily, uh, does it make it moral? No, because not for me, because it, uh, that's not something that God has permitted, okay? Now, the question then lies in, uh, in, in if we were to then take, if we take this like philosophical understanding that biology determines your, your morality, and it, that's a popular idea, then why are we inconsistent? Why don't we say that if a person is predisposed to be more aggressive in their temperament, Right, which is the case, that domestic violence should be excused, for example. Okay? Um, if a person has an alcoholism predisposition, which is proven, then 
why shouldn't they, uh, why is alcoholism a bad thing and addiction a bad thing? Okay? Why apply this double standard? Okay? So if we, again, if we believe that the state should not get involved in, uh, and morality should not be involved in the bedroom, in the private decisions of the sexuality of independent consensual adults, then why do we then restrict incest? Okay? So if we are, in, we're inconsistent in this. Do you understand? Like in the Islamic tradition, we we're consistent in our philosophical sort of like conception of how morality follows. It's linear. Ver uh, but in popular culture, it's socially based. It's culturally based. What's okay today might not be okay tomorrow. What's okay yesterday might not be okay tomorrow, whatnot. So, to, and, and uh, Richard Dawkins actually makes this claim. He says, we have the biological sophistication to reverse any genetic uh, abnormalities in incest. And he says, we are at the point where incest should be legal. Like a person who marries, uh, uh, you know, a brother and sister get married. Psychologically, if you think about it, um, the person, in terms of marital success, the person whom you're most similar to is the person whom you're most likely to get along with, okay? And the person you, you're more likely to have marital success with. So from a psychological, logical standpoint, your sister knows you best, you grew up in the same environment. Logically, it shouldn't be an issue, right? But why do we restrict it? We restrict it because somehow that's morally not digestible by our current uh, ethics.